Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're taking a look at a Winchester Model 1894. But really, we're talking about this, I think, fascinating little forgotten corner of history uh, that is the Spruce Production Division of the US Army Signal Corps. And this is in fact a martially marked Winchester 1894 that was purchased and issued by said Signal Corps during World War I. Now you might wonder what on earth is the Signal Corps doing with Winchesters in World War I? Well, the answer is they're deploying combat troops to the Pacific Northwest to cut down trees. So logistics win wars, and when the US entered World War I, of course, the Western Allies wanted American troops. We had a large population, untapped resource there. But the US also had a lot of natural resources and industrial capacity that could be put to very effective use in supporting the Western Allies uh, in the war. And we'd been doing this already. US gun companies were making tremendous numbers of firearms for the British, the French, the Russians. Uh, but now that we're in the war, things can kind of kick up a bit. Now, one of the resources that everybody was coming to the US for was lumber for airplanes, specifically Sitka spruce, a very specific species that uh, grows primarily in the Pacific Northwest, goes up from Northern California to Alaska, but like the, the heart of it, the really the best is basically in the Oregon area. And it turns out Sitka spruce is about the best lumber that you can use for a World War I aircraft for a couple of reasons. Like this probably isn't stuff they typically cover in forestry or carpentry classes, but uh, Sitka spruce, is, they're very large trees. We're talking 20, 30, 35 plus feet in diameter or uh, in circumference, 200 and more feet tall, very straight, no branches, ideal for making uh, very long pieces of wood that have a very straight grain, have very strong long fibers in them. Apparently, here's an interesting uh, piece of trivia, Sitka spruce does not tend to splinter when hit by bullets, which makes it ideal for World War I aircraft uh, construction because an aircraft can take some battle damage and not fall apart, which is a big plus. Uh, so the US in 1917 is looking around and saying, well, okay, look, we're making, it was something like 2.3 million board feet of spruce uh, production in the area per year. And they figured we really needed to have more like 10 million board feet of production to satisfy not only uh, the US production of aircraft, which by the way, at the time was the domain of the US Army Signal Corps, which is why this rifle was purchased by the Signal Corps and why the Signal Corps is the one going around dealing with aircraft construction. Uh, anyway, so we need this wood not just for American construction, but also to supply British and French customers who are busy trying to build their airplanes out of the best timber they can, which is American Sitka spruce from the Pacific Northwest. So uh, the Army dispatches a longtime career officer, he's been recalled to active duty for World War I uh, by the name of Bryce P. Disk, and he is a colonel at the time. They dispatch him up to Vancouver, basically, to figure out like what's going on, how do we get more spruce? And he goes up there and he discovers that the industry is kind of in a chaotic situation. Uh, there is a lot of labor unrest um, fomented by the International Workers of the World, the IWW or the Wobblies. They're active, they're, they're trying to push for uh, limited working hours, better pay, better working con uh, conditions, everything that the IWW was known for at the time. Uh, and by the way, their tactics included strikes, sabotage, spiking trees, you know, bit, bit going into fairly dangerous stuff. Like this was, this was having a serious impact on the industry in the area. Uh, Disc, the Colonel, he's not particularly interested in anyone's political ambitions either way. Uh, he sees it as his mission to produce more spruce, however this needs to be done. And so he does a couple of things. And the first one, very interestingly, and this gets a lot of uh, polarized press in, in the history that talks about it because of the overall political um, overtones of anything really involving labor rights and the IWW, etc. Uh, but Disc actually seems to be a really fairly even-handed guy and does a better job than perhaps a lot of the documentation gives him credit for. What he does is he sets up, the first thing he does is he sets up the four L's uh, with 
you know, he, he submits this idea to Washington. They think it sounds great. So they tell him to go, go ahead and do it. Um, and that is the Loyal Legion of Loggers and Lumbermen, which is basically his de facto, turns into a de facto union that undermines the AFL, the CIO, the IWW, and all of the other labor unions in the area with a stated mission of basically, we're here to defeat the Kaiser. Um, and we're going to, you know, chaos, unrest, and uh, inefficiency hurts the US war effort. And so we want to avoid that. And in the process, he actually mandates, uh, DISC is able to mandate an eight hour working day, which is actually one of the things that the IWW was specifically trying to get. He provides that. There's, there's a balance. This isn't, this is often portrayed as the army marches in with guns and commandeers the labor force. And it's really much more, much more detailed, much more even handed, much more subtle than that. Now, the second thing that DISC does is uh, they, he ends up creating, or the Signal Corps ends up creating the Spruce Production Division, where they send about 25,000 uh, enlisted army servicemen into the Pacific Northwest, most of them volunteers with previous experience in the industry, to actually work as loggers and lumbermen. And the idea is that they're basically seconded to commercial logging companies. They are paid commercial rates. Uh, the army pays them their basic army pay, and the commercial companies that hire them pay everything above that to get them to a competitive uh, private uh, wage. But they remain under military authority, and so the military is able to do projects uh, in the industry that wouldn't necessarily get done by individual companies who are competing with each other. So they, for example, set up a significant network of rail lines. One of the things that DISC discovers when he looks at this situation is in order to most efficiently process these spruce logs, well, we need trees, we need sections that are like 22 feet long in order to make wing and fuselage beams for these aircraft. Those logs, you want them to be intact so you can get the best wood out of the middle, and you can only transport those by rail because they weigh many, many, many tons. They're too heavy to move by cart or by truck or by road. Uh, so the U.S. Signal Corps starts the process of setting up a lot of transportation infrastructure, which would actually uh, do a lot for the timber industry in the region for decades to come after the war. He, um, well, before I go too much farther, let me show you the rifle here, because among this spruce uh, spruce production division, there were actually 12 squadrons, this being the, the, the proto Air Force, there were 12 squadrons of troops who were actually armed, and they were armed with these rifles. Now the primary mission of the spruce production division was in fact spruce production, not military affairs, uh, directly military affairs. However, it was recognized that some of these troops ought to be armed. They are a military unit after all. There are going to be military police duties. Um, there is the potential, especially at the time, the, the potential of sabotage or um, labor unrest, which was typically treated with lethal force at the time. Uh, and so they needed some guns. Uh, of the 25,000 men, they ordered 1,800 guns. So this was a relatively small percentage of the troops who were armed. They weren't typically, these weren't the guys, they weren't carrying these guns out into timber camps. They were uh, the troops who were, you know, in the, stationed at the Vancouver barracks and that sort of thing. Well, military arms production in the U.S. is really needed over in Europe. Uh, the Springfields and the 1917 Enfields that are pr being produced you, it's, you have a hard time justifying taking those potential frontline infantry rifles and deploying them to Vancouver. However, Winchester had continued to, uh, to market and produce these guns during the war. They already had the tooling and the production lines, and well, they were pretty motivated to sell them. And so the Signal Corps ended up ordering 1800 Winchester Model 94s. They were delivered to the troops in January of 1918. They are chambered for 30 Winchester Centerfire, aka 3030. Upon receipt, they were marked with US and a flaming bomb uh, logo there. That center mark right here is the standard Winchester production uh, proof mark. Uh, take a note of the style of these markings because there are fake examples of these rifles out there. Uh, in, the, in, in the collector world, these are colloquially called spruce guns. 
uh, and there are indeed uh, a fair number of fake ones that have shown up. Now, unfortunately, we don't know exactly which serial numbers were sent to the army, because the Winchester records for these guns in this time period have been lost. We know, however, that they ran between serial numbers 835,000 and 853,000. So that's about 25,000 guns, of which only 1,800 uh, went to the Spruce Division. But uh, if you have a Winchester with a serial number within that range, like this one, and proper US Marshall markings like those, that is very likely one of the Spruce Production Division guns. Other than those small elements, these are basic standard commercial Winchester 94s. Um, they still have saddle rings on them, they're carbines of course. Uh, there, is, there were no other custom features added to them for the, the Signal Corps. Because these are very utilitarian guns, and they were presumably surplused, when they were surplused, they were surplused off in the Pacific Northwest, where they made great hunting rifles, great, uh, well, I would say truck guns, but there weren't a whole lot of people driving trucks in 1920. Uh, very utilitarian rifles, and so a lot of them uh, have been kind of lost in the woodwork amongst all the other Winchester 94s out there. A lot of them have been uh, you know, beat up and used and had parts replaced, but it's a really cool uh, specific piece of US military history if you can find it. Since I have this here, I want to show it to you as well. This is the collar pin from the Loyal Legion of Loggers and Lumbermen. Uh, everyone who signed up for the Legion uh, got a membership card and one of these pins to wear on their suspenders, as this gentleman is right there. And you can see a, a whole cool set of iconography on there. There's an airplane on top uh, that was uh, spruce for aircraft. There's a ship in the middle. Uh, that was fur, which was used primarily for ship construction. Uh, the bottom there's a saw and an axe crossed. Uh, some nice big examples of spruce trees on the sides. And this whole organization was in fact authorized by the Secretary of War. They put a big emphasis on the fact that this was a patriotic, um, you know, we're all going to work together to end the war against the Kaiser who started this whole thing because he's evil sort of organization. So I rambled quite a lot about this just, I think, really fascinating piece of Pacific Northwest history um, at the beginning. But the upshot was um, when the war ended, almost immediately upon the war ending, the Spruce Production Division, which had, by the way, by that point been um, uh, organized as an actual corporation, um, the United States Spruce Production Corporation, I believe it was called, uh, it was basically shuttered immediately at the end of the war, and all of its projects were shut down, uh, and all of its assets were, not that long afterwards, sold at auction. So you have this, this division that existed for just about a year. Um, it was the beginning of 1918, very end of 1917, when uh, the troops were actually allocated uh, to the Spruce Production Division, and end of 1918 they're demobilized. So uh, this just very fleeting Fleeting example of a US military organization armed with Winchester 94s. These are probably not the only US Marshal Winchester 94s. There's some evidence that the Border Patrol had some, and there may have been a few other domestic organizations, domestic military uh, uses for some of these guns. But I think this is probably by and large the, lar the, the biggest single group of uh, US military Winchester 94s. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video, even though there wasn't a whole lot of the gun in it. Hopefully you got a, a kick out of this and learned an interesting new subject that you can delve into in more depth if you're interested. Thanks for watching.